lecture. So we would also like to hear from uh, from you about how you are, you know, managing safety in your clinics. I should say that last week we had an excellent lecture from Professor Stephen Avery from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I actually think the course, the lecture he gave was really uh, loaded with a lot of stuff, materials. So over the next uh, weeks, we are going to be focusing on the different aspects that he mentioned during that lecture, um, including, you know, how do you design your machine, your linear accelerator with your best friend, treating patients, and how do you do dosimetry, how do you do treatment planning, and most importantly, how you do quality assurance to make sure that um, patients are treated safely. So the topic today is going to be about treating safely, which is, uh, in principle, the responsibility of every single person working in the radiation oncology department. This includes the radiation oncologists, the doctors, the MDs. It also includes particularly the medical physicists, which is really these, those who are attending this class uh, should have that interest. I think that uh, the doctors can also learn from this class because uh, it's the responsibility of everybody to make sure that um, patients are treated safely. Okay, uh, we also should say that even the radiation therapists, I don't know how it is in your clinic, some clinics have you know, radiation therapies as well. Uh, they even have dosimetries, people will do the dose calculations um, supervised by the medical mm -hmm. physicist. Okay, so, but, the importance of safety cannot be uh, safety cannot be overemphasized. And so, during this lecture, I'm going to talk about the experience that um, is done, how it's done in the United States. You know, some of the experiences here in the United States. And uh, towards the end of the lecture, I would like to also hear from you guys about um, you know what what you think is most important for to support how we can support you to ensure that uh, patients that have been treated in your clinic are treated safely. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna begin, go over these slides. So um, I should begin by acknowledging that some of these slides actually are from uh, Professor William Hendy, who is the uh, Editor-in-Chief for Medical Physics Journal here in the United States. He is also one of the luminaries in medical physics and has really been instrumental in this field. Uh, so I want to start with a very interesting, uh, some of these articles that happened in the United States in 2010. So the New York Times, which is one of the leading uh, journals here in the United States, uh, basically they reported number, a number of times about the issue of safety. Um, let me see here. Uh, Dr. Credit, are you still there? Okay, yes, I would I'm say that if, okay, right, I, I, I can say, I would say that you should monitor the questions uh, in the chat. Okay. Or if you, you both monitor the questions. If somebody has a question to ask, they can just type it in the chat and uh, and then you can, you can ask, you can direct those questions when the time comes. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay great. So, um, so in 2010, you know, the New York Times published a number of uh, articles in the journal talking about uh, the problems with safety. Um, and one of them was basically highlighting, um, you know, incidences that had happened where they overdosed patients uh, in the clinic. Uh, and one of them is the kind of very New Jersey, 36 cancer patients at a veterans hospital uh, were over irradiated. Uh, 20 more received substandard treatment uh, by a medical team that lacked experience in using the machine. The mistakes, which could have been publicly reported, continued for months because the hospital had no system in place to catch the errors. I want to say this mainly to say that, you know, radiation safety is not just an issue in developing countries or in Africa or Asia or sub -Saharan or South, South America. Uh, this is actually something that uh, affects everybody, including the United States where you have or you would think everything should be good. Um, another situation was in Louisiana, where a patient received 38 straight overdoses of radiation, each nearly twice the prescribed amount, and they were 
undergoing treatment for prostate cancer. Uh, the problem in this case was that uh, the machine was new to the hospital. And so they made a miscalculation, uh, even while the people were commissioning the machines were still there. Uh, I am aware that many of you attending this lecture uh, actually have new machines being stored in your clinic. Uh, and you know that's the most important thing that all medical physicists are trained to ensure that that machine uh, is calibrated in such a way that you know the patients, this kind of errors don't happen. So when you say you're gonna give two gray of radiation dose to a patient, that the patient actually gets two gray, not more, not less. Um, and so, you know, the calibration is actually a very, very important part. And in next week's lecture, that's gonna be the focus. Um, next week's lecture, the professor is gonna be giving the lecture, is gonna focus mainly on uh, making sure that you can learn how the machine is calibrated uh, and knowing the parts of the different parts of the different parts of the machine. All right, I talk about another case in Texas. Uh, what happens was that uh, this patient had to, you know, had external box for, you know, for urinating and for, um, for, um, for stooling because of severe radiation injuries that they suffered. Uh, and partly this was because uh, a medical physicist was overworked uh, and failed to, to detect the error or a mistake. And this is actually something that I think happens more commonly than we, we know, especially in lower middle income countries where you may have very few medical physicists working in a hospital or in the center. Uh, I know many centers where there are even just one, only one medical physicist. And, um, and this is really hard on them because they have to do a lot of, a lot of things by themselves. Uh, and, you know, to err is human. Uh, it means that there are times when you'll be tired and you may not have the same vigilance. But the consequences can be very devastating. You know, so you have a patient here who becomes disabled because of that. Um, these mistakes, the New York Times actually mentioned, wrote some statements which I think I really agree with. They say these mistakes and the failure of the hospitals to quickly identify them, you know, they offer a real look into the vulnerability of patients and safeguards at the time when uh, increasingly complex computer controlled devices are using, being used to deliver higher doses of radiation. And this is really true. As you get new linear, accelerator, uh, new linear accelerators, whether it's a variant or it's an elector, uh, it's best medical, you know, whatever machine you are getting, this come with treatment planning systems that are complex. Um, and, you know, sometimes there are many factors that contribute to the fact that you, these errors happen. And we're gonna look at some of those, those factors. Um, another situation happened in Philadelphia where um, they give the wrong radiation dose to more than 90 patients with prostate cancer and then kept quiet about it. So in one situation, you know, these errors happen, people don't know that those errors are happening. Uh, in other situations, the hospitals actually have safeguards in place. They are able to uh, realize that there was an error but they kept quiet about it. Uh, that's the same thing in Florida, 2005, a hospital disclosed that 77 brain cancer patients had received 50% more radiation than was prescribed. Um, you know, so this is really, um, sometimes the, doc the, the, doc the hospitals actually know that that happened. But the most important thing is that, you know, once you know that, you have to try to correct it, make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, I should say that medical physicists have been working really hard. I can say that once these, uh, these incidences were reported in the New York Times, they called uh, the leaders of medical physics in the United States to Congress. And um, they had to basically make uh, amends. Basically they had to say why, what they would do to make sure that this doesn't happen again or can reduce these incidences from happening again. Uh, so it's very important to highlight that medical physicists, uh, you know, need to have a clear strategy for maintaining quality and safety. Uh, and, you know, by working together as a good, as a team in the radiation oncology hospital, that is uh, one way that you, have, you can actually achieve this. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the ways that these errors happened. Uh, the New York Times actually found that, uh, you know, there are a number of possibilities where you can have software flaws. So the software that's being used um, may have errors. 
uh, there's also poor safety procedures in the clinic if you're not following the protocols that uh, are okay, that are already established for that clinic, then, you know, errors are bound to happen. Uh, you know, like key errors, key, key protocols in the United States include the task group report 51, uh, which if, if you Google, you can find, you know, that's really for calibration, calibrating the machines. Uh, some centers in Africa use that, that, that protocol, but, um, you know, the Europe, in Europe, they also use other protocols, which, but the bottom line is that you want to make sure that your uh, machine is actually delivering the right dose that you think it should deliver to the patients. Another error, uh, source of error is because you have inadequate staffing, uh, which means that, like I mentioned, you may have in a hospital just one, uh, you know, one medical physicist. And in some situations you have, I've seen, I've gone to the, there was one time I went to, to Tanzania to give a talk and they had brought about 21 medical physicists from each, from 21 African countries and the uh, ministries of health uh, representatives um, to talk about safety. But, you know, in this case, some of the medical physicists who were there uh, were the only ones from the countries where they came from, which meant that, you know, the big question was while they were there in Tanzania um, during that workshop, who, who was back the, in the hospital taking care of safety? You know, it basically meant that, you know, you have one medical physicist in the whole country or in a cancer center. Uh, if the, 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 the medical physicist is not there, then who takes, who takes over? So th there's a big issue of inadequate staffing that can really account for some of the safety issues that are happening in the clinic. All right, so one of the ways to address that obviously is to train more people. Um, and so, and not just train people from scratch, but also have the continuous education, which is one of the things that these global health career program, uh, you know, wants to do. And uh, as we go forward, you know, we're actually going to have regional workshops to also help training everybody. You know, even a medical physicist has to, has to be a continuous lifetime of learning uh, and improvement. So it's quite important that you have the training; otherwise, these errors are going to happen. Um, you know, so I kind of talked about this, but it's nice to have a picture of what we are talking about. So this is uh, actually um, Jerome Parks and his family. This was one of the patients who uh, was overdosed with radiation. And, uh, you know, it was really bad because, you know, he couldn't even speak. He became deaf. Uh, he, you know, he, he was really handicapped. And, and because of that, his whole family suffered. And radiation therapy is a really good thing, but in this case, you know, you can have a picture of this beautiful family that has to suffer because, um, you know, errors were made. Okay, I kind of highlight this again in New York, uh, so just, to, just to say that this is so important that it's not only ha really happening. I can almost guarantee that it happens in your clinic, you know? So it happens even in the United States where you have so many medical physicists or radiation oncologists or people trying to take care of that. You know, um, in fact, some studies show that medical errors kill more people than accidents, than road accidents in the United, in the United States. So this is something that's definitely happening. Um, and I just want to point out that it's not bad. Actually, most hospitals, um, like my hospital at Harvard, they actually reward you if you can report errors. Uh, you know, you're not punished for that, which is a different culture as I'm aware of for most developing countries where people fear to report the errors. And so, which means nobody can learn from them and that will be repeated. Okay, so this slide actually talks about what happened in New York. Um, you know, so 2001 to 2008, they reported 621 events, uh, actually with two notable deaths that resulted from that. There are situations where you have near miss events, um, but there were several causes for this, you know. One time is a flawed quality assurance plan Another time is just an error in inputting data. So imagine that you want to do a treatment plan and you put in, you know, 60 gray instead of 30 gray. You know, you do the treatment calculation. There's nobody to check that you did that. Uh, that can lead to an error. Uh, even worse is that sometimes you may have uh, wrong patients. Uh, this happens quite often than you, you think. You know, so sometimes you have a patient that you are treating 
and you're using a completely a treatment plan for a different patient. Uh, that happens more often than you, you can imagine. And then, you know, sometimes it's because, you know, you didn't have a, the right collimator um, or wedge, uh, this hardware malfunction, for malfunction a software bug, or, um, you know, you know so er erroneous software override. So this can happen due to several uh, reasons. And uh, the big question is how can you, you know, make sure that this doesn't happen? Um, in this slide, so basically what you see here is safety and radiation therapy, a call to action. After this report in the New York Times, you know, like I, said, like I mentioned, the Congress called Astro Leaders, that's the Society for Radiation Oncologists, and the AAPM's American Association of Medical Physicists, uh, to Congress, and they had to testify. Um, they got a lot of uh, other partners who endorsed, you know, recommendations on how they can make sure that this doesn't happen going forward. Um, so the big question is, is this happening in your clinic? Uh, and, you know, and I have to say that each one of you who is on this uh, lecture today can help make sure it doesn't happen in your clinic, or at least reduce the number of times that it happens, because we know that inevitably something happens at some point. Um, OK, so uh, what are the different levels of, uh, what are the different areas where you can have errors happen? Like I mentioned, radiation therapy is kind of complex treatment uh, modality. Uh, it starts with diagnosis, you know, where you do the CT imaging, you know, you do all that imaging, especially now that you move from 2D to 3D uh, and IMRT in your clinics. Um, you know, so imaging is actually a central to each step of the process in being able to deliver safe radiation therapy to patients. You have the diagnosis, you have the prescription, um, usually by the, the radiation oncologist, uh, and then you have to do the simulation and the planning. That's where medical physicists kick in, and then the verification and the de delivery. You know, and then following that, you want to make sure that you evaluate and make sure that the patient, um, you know, is responding well to the radiation. And sometimes you may even do adapt. You can adapt the treatment plan, you know, during the course of the uh, treatment of the patient. So these different steps, you know, there's a lot of uh, imaging involved because you have to deal with the CT images or PET imaging or whatever images that, you know, uh, you're involved, you have in your clinic. Um, so, you know, the different complexity, uh, the complexity of the radiation therapy can be seen in the different diseases that are treated. So how you treat prostate cancer is very different from the way that you would treat breast cancer or you treat lung cancer, right? So, you know, by itself, you can't just say the same kind of treatment procedure or protocol or treatment plan that they use for prostate. I would use that for uh, breast cancer. You know, that's, that's, those are two different things. And the number of fields or radiation therapy, uh, ang the angles where you use to deliver the treatment will be different for each side. Um, and so it's a complex process in the sense that you need to be able to know that this is different for each side. Um, the technology employed is also different. So imagine you may have variant machine, or you may have elector machine, uh, or you may have a cobalt machine. So each one of these technologies has a completely different treatment planning software. Uh, so you have to learn that and also, you know, adapt to to making sure that that technology is used correctly. You know, the information flow is quite important. You know, how how do you uh, communicate with the uh, as a medical physicist, how do you com communicate with the oncologist? How do you, how do you communicate with the radiation therapists? Um, you know, if you don't communicate well, then what can happen is that errors will more easily happen. Uh, so the human interactions are, are key. You know, um, you know, if you if if you don't have good human interactions to communicate uh, with each other, then um, you're gonna that's a big big source of error. And then finally, the treatment evaluation to ensure that you know um, you you evaluate the treatment for each patient. And sometimes you may need that you have to you may have heard about adaptive radiation therapy. You may have to adapt as you go along. So after treating the, the first time the patient comes and you give one fraction, uh, by evaluating you may decide to change um, by the time the next the patient comes the next time. So that's really important. Um, in this slide, I just want to also highlight again the complexity of the process and why we always get these errors. Uh, 
you know, so you have the consultation, the patient information, prescription, uh, the QA is really part of where medical physics is involved and also the treatment planning. Um, you know, sometimes you have to learn how to contour as well, which is something that, uh, you know, typically the doctors have to do. Um, but, you know, there's so many people involved, different users, you have physicians, you have physicists, you have therapists, you have dosimetries, uh, you have information system staff, uh, and then you have administrative staff. And the technologies are different. If you've got a Linux uh, from Varian or Elector, you may have what you have, you may have the electronic portal imaging device. You may have a CBCT, Conbeam CT, uh, or KV to localize. Uh, in fact, one of the most advanced image, uh, advanced radiation therapy modalities currently is image guided radiation therapy. Uh, so you see what you treat essentially. So, which means that, you know, you have to, there's a lot of imaging involved. And each of these imaging systems by themselves also needs some quality assurance, which is done by the medical physicists. Um, more interestingly, and, and this is a really sympathize with most uh, of our colleagues uh, in Africa or South America or Asia, because most medical physicists, as much as they would love to do, you know, like research, um, they don't really have the time to do that. Uh, and that's so important because it's important to see whether some of the protocols that are developed in the United States or Europe uh, that are being recommended to you to, to, to implement, sometimes you know, those, those protocols may not be the best for your own uh, setting. You may not have all the tools that are in those protocols. And many of you have to improvise and it may be nice to actually report on some of those things that you do. Uh, I know that there's a talk you know, in uh, the Federation of African Medical Physicists Organization led by my friend Taufik uh, about even finding uh, ways that you can have a journal of your own where you know you can report your the research being done in your clinic and some of the good practices that you that other people can copy from you know and you know it's just sad that you know you're always overworked or you don't have you know uh, these opportunities to be able to do research as well so you know this is something that we hope that even through the global career program we can uh, be able to support, um, you know, medical physicists to also get involved in research sometimes and travel and report some of those results. You know, that's something that is quite relevant. Um, again, this picture kind of shows how human interactions uh, in radiation oncology. You know, from one side you have all the physicians. You know, you have the physicians from the front desk when the patient walks into the clinic, uh, has to consult, and then. Uh, you know, has to be scattered. They have to do radiation therapy. They have to go see the physician and then the simulation, uh, and then the treatment planning and the dosimetries, you know, and then following that, having the medical physicist do the quality assurance, which is done uh, for every patient specifically. Uh, so for each patient, you have to do the quality assurance, especially if you are doing IMRT, and most of you are getting IMRT systems right now. So that's, that's, um, interaction that you also have to have with a number of people, including the, 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 the physician. Um, and then you have the treatment delivery where you have radiation therapists doing this. I know hospitals where, you know, the doctors do uh, these different things, these th three different things. They even do some of the work the medical physicists do. Um, so again, it's not supposed to be like that. And, you know, if it happens like that, you know, we really salute, you know, how, how you manage to do that. But you know, we need to kind of make sure that there's enough staff to do the different things here. Um, so why do errors occur? You know, again, the process is quite complex. You know, that's, that's why, you know, safety is so important. Uh, it could be sometimes that the technology malfunctions. You've read in the news about sometimes when even the, 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 the machines break down. Um, you know, there was this very famous story in, U in Uganda where the machine broke down and for for months, you know, patients could not be treated. And, you know, obviously <laughs> for medical physicists, you know, each day you do your stuff. Sometimes you wonder why do you do it? Why do you always have to keep doing your daily QA? This by daily quality assurance, I mean every single day, you know, I, I'm sure that you do that in your hospital. You put this phantom there with the ion chamber and you turn on the beam, you make sure that the dose that you get from the ion chamber reading is the same as you got yesterday, 
right? So you do that every single day at the beginning of the day to make sure that uh, when patients come in, you actually show that the dosimetry is okay. So sometimes you may relax and say, well, what I measured yesterday with my iron chamber at this same setup is the same as today, the same as tomorrow. And then over time, you may think maybe I need to just keep one day or skip a week before I do it. Um, that's not allowed because the reason you do that is because one day that machine is going to break down. Uh, and you want to make sure that the day that that machine malfunctions or breaks down, that you, you caught it. Uh, because otherwise, you know, the pictures I showed you, the stories that happened in New York and reported in the New York Times, uh, those things will happen, you know. So um, please don't get complacent. It's very important to make sure that we don't get complacent. Um, uh, other things that why is errors occur is that humans are involved. Some of it is uh, I've talked to um, somebody in one of the clinics in in Africa. I don't want to mention the country where, uh, where where she basically mentions the fact that she's alone in that clinic and um, and she walks in silos. She's even afraid to talk to her boss about you know when she faces a difficulty and she doesn't know what to do. Partly because you know the people who are above her or her boss in the clinic uh, would look down or frown down, frown and ask, you know, you're supposed to know this when you were trained. Uh, and so, and sometimes it's just the ego, you know, people are proud, they don't wanna appear as if they don't know something. Uh, but the consequence of that is really real and tangible, which means that, you know, the, the, the person who told me this said that sometimes she is very afraid that the dose that you know, the radiation dose that's going to the patients is not the right one. Uh, it's not the right prescription. It's not going to the right place. Uh, and all because uh, she walks in silos and she is afraid to talk to somebody. Uh, in some situations is that you don't even have somebody to talk to. Um, and again, if you do that, if that happens, you know, then what happens is that the patient is gonna suffer. So when humans are involved, you know, there are different things that are complex, complexities here. You know, there could be different factors. Um, and so uh, hopefully, and that's one of the things that we also want to create going forward is kind of create this kind of forum where, you know, you can even share, you know, different challenges that are being faced in the clinic. Uh, and I can tell you that in the United States, you know, that's actually rewarded. It's rewarded. It's not, it's not something that you should be, people should be afraid. And it's a culture in the hospital that people should report things, not try to hide them. Uh, people are rewarded because they report things. Because if you report the thing, you know, patients will be, you know, safety is increased. You know, you can, even if you make an error, people can correct that. So to err is human. Everybody's going to err. It's not just uh, in your clinic. It's also happening in the United States and in Europe. So it means that, you know, it's something that uh, we shouldn't be afraid to share. Okay. So the process must be, you know, to ensure that everybody, person is safe, you know, the process must be fault tolerant, which means that everybody should understand their responsibility. You know, if you're a medical physicist, do you really know what your role as a medical physicist is? Uh, if you are a radiation oncologist as a doctor, do you know what your role is? Uh, you know, and, and, and in Europe, I really like what's done in Netherlands because, you know, the, they actually have very, very equal, um, you know, equal roles, the, the doctor and the medical physicist in parallel, and there's mutual, very mutual respect. You know, everybody knows what they are supposed to do. It's clearly, the functions are clear. Um, and sometimes in some areas, in hospitals where you don't have a medical physicist, uh, I can tell you that in most, there are many centers in Africa, they don't even know the function, the role of a medical physicist. Um, in fact, the reason why I went uh, to this IAEA conference as an expert, as an expert was to kind of to tell the ministers of health and the government leaders that you know medical physicists have an important role to play, you know, in cancer treatment. If you don't have them, you have to hire them. In most institutions, that in countries they don't even have medical physicists, or they are not part of the civil service or the payment structure that they have similar to doctors. Uh, and so, you know. That's really partly because they don't understand the responsibility of the medical physicist or the roles that they're supposed to play. In that case, errors will happen, you know, because doctors are not trained necessarily to do those things. Um, okay, the other thing is also to make sure that early warnings uh, and, uh, can be recorded. Sometimes, you know, like a machine uh, starts to behave 
uh, in ways that you know it shouldn't behave. Those are good things that you know uh, to catch that. I know now that you know there's a collaboration between uh, people are bringing artificial intelligence into it, where you know if a machine is about you know the errors can be caught way ahead of time, you know, so that you know you can also get spare parts there, so you can repair the machine uh, when the machine breaks down. You don't have to wait till when the machine has broken down or has hurt some patient before you start trying to remedy the situation. And I think the most important thing here is the fact that we have to be able to learn from our errors, uh, our mistakes. Um, and so, you know, uh, which means that these this mistakes need to be reported, or at least you should be able to know that you made a mistake. Uh, and then corrective actions to be followed after, after those mistakes are made. In many clinics we have uh, in the United States and Europe, you know, you have to have audits that happen. So it means that you have an external group that comes in and make sure that, you know, everybody's doing the right thing. Um, sometimes they even just send around, you know, a phantom, uh, you know, like, and it asks everybody in that to deliver the same, to deliver a dose to that phantom, given a certain settings, and they compare that across institutions to make sure that, uh, to see if that's, you know, you get the same dose. Um, so in that way, you can, you can maintain uh, certain standards. And it's happened that, actually, I probably have some data on that, uh, and I'll probably show you later on, how there can be variability between different clinics you know, um, for the same thing. Kind of tells you that uh, something's wrong. So this external audits can be very helpful. Um, so, you know, what should be done? What should we be doing for patient safety? Again, uh, we all have different roles and overlapping roles sometimes, uh, but we have the MDs, the radiation oncologists or clinical oncologists as they may be called in your hospital. And then you have the physicists, you have the radiation therapist. Um, you have administrators who sometimes are the ones who make decisions about which machine is ordered, or they make decisions that you know are not actually informed because they didn't communicate well with the oncologists or physicists. Uh, you also need the IT. Uh, increasingly, as you do 3D, you have to have the treatment planning, so you have to make sure the software is okay. And uh, obviously, you have the vendors and the regulators which for most African countries is mostly the IAEA, uh, you know, and we really need to work with these regulators because we want to make sure that patients, everything is safe. Okay, um, what's the gold standard for safety? Um, if you don't, one of the gold standards that people use for safety is really aviation. Uh, as you may imagine, you know, one of the safest uh, systems that, you know, that exist in the world is aviation, so flying. You know, the safety protocols that, uh, you know, people use, if you imagine how many flights happen each day and how many accidents actually get to happen. You know, sometimes when, uh, you know, there's an airplane crash, you know, it's always in the news and it's a big deal, but if you come to think about it, you know, you will see how safe air travel actually is because we don't have accidents as often as you can imagine. You know, road, road accidents happen more regularly than that. So the gold standard that hospitals use typically for uh, safety is uh, aviation or, you know, NASA, for example, has, you know, really high, kind of high standards for, for. And so what that means is that, you know, there are a number of things that you have to do, which means that you have to make sure that people are well trained. Training and education is really, really at the top of the pyramid. Uh, you know, if people are not trained, uh, if you don't have the human capacity, then, you know, obviously the, there's nobody who is going to be, safety is a big problem there. All right. Once you train the individuals, now the next thing you have to make sure that you have the same, the right rules and policies that have to be implemented. Um, and then you also have to have reminders and checklists. So every clinic should have those checklists to make sure that, um, you know, the protocols, you, are remind, you have those reminders to make sure that you follow, um, you're reminded about what you're supposed to do. And then uh, you also want to make sure that things are simp simpler, simplified. You know, uh, you don't want, you want to simplify the complexity that we just talked about. And then sometimes you want to do, involve computers. Uh, more and more you're hearing about artificial intelligence and, you know, how you can make things, automate things to happen. In fact, that's what happens when you're uh, doing your treatment planning. The optimization is really automatic. Once you've decided, okay, I want to treat with seven fields, 
uh, you know, this is the dose, this number of fractions that I'm going to give. Then essentially the computer calculates everything for you. And uh, all you need to do at the end is to then do the quality assurance to make sure that the dose, uh, what you prescribe and it's calculated is actually what you want to deliver. Uh, another, another way to ensure safety is to have uh, interlocks in the system so that, you know, if some condition is not fulfilled, then, you know, the beam doesn't come on. And uh, most clinics, most of machines have those interlocks. So you have to have such uh, effective nets, make sure that you have all these different components in your clinic. Um, safety culture. So that's a really important part, you know, and we, the medical physicists, uh, if you're a medical physicist, you have to make sure that you, um, this culture is, you know, we, we, in the, we in the radiation oncology department, the oncologists, the medical physicists, the therapists, this really is on us to make sure that we have a culture of safety. Uh, and it should be top down, which means that from the top person in the clinic, you know, to the person who is the trainee, who is just coming in, they should really realize that safety is the most important thing. Uh, and all us to be empowered to do so. It means that you know, somebody, if, if somebody is doubting, is in doubt about whether we should proceed to treat the patient or not, or whether the treatment plan is okay, then second checks need to be done. Uh, in the United States, the therapists always have to, there's a policy, a culture of safety policy that the therapists have to take a timeout every certain period of time. So it means that after they treat a certain number of patients, uh, they must take a timeout, it's required. And part of it is maybe take a work, drink some coffee or some tea, um, to make sure that you, you refresh before you, know, you get back to, to treating patients. So that's, that's actually a culture of safety that, um, that kind of example needs to be implemented. Um, another part of it is that you have to set expectations for the staff to make sure that you know everybody uh, doesn't feel sometimes do not feel that reporting an error that they will be penalized. Um, and so in the United States, they actually have an incidence reporting system. During the course of this particular course, I think early next year, uh, we're going to talk about how these incidence reporting systems work. Uh, you know, in the United States and how they've been trying to implement some of that in different African countries. Each hospital should be able to have that kind of uh, reporting system, which is usually anonymous. Uh, the problem with Africa, obviously, is that, or lower middle income countries in general, is that, you know, if you just have one person in a clinic, you know, and the person reports anonymously, uh, obviously you're gonna know who it is. So that becomes uh, something that needs to be addressed in different ways. So. You know, we're going to have a course, a class on that, I think, early next year, being given by uh, one of the professors about how this can be addressed. Um, okay, so I'm coming to the end of this, but I think um, one way that has been tested and shown, many studies have shown that if you respect uh, the different staff that you have, uh, don't make people feel that, you know, if they come to talk to you, you look down on them or you know, the you know, top-down approach means that the leaders should be able to listen and respect everybody and be supported if they, you know, come up with, you know, suggestions and that they should be appreciated. Somebody does something, you know, you want to appreciate to make them feel that they are part of the team. And working together, you know, we can actually ensure that patients have are safer. All right. So uh, a number of recommendations made, like I mentioned, when the New York Times reported those incidences. Uh, that happened in the United States, then, you know, uh, it was on us, uh, radiation oncologists and medical physicists and therapists, everybody to develop recommendations that will minimize uh, this from happening. Um, one of those is that, you know, you know, you want to make sure that uh, at a point of care, uh, which means in the clinic, uh, make sure that, that working there, you know, they have the control, which means as a medical physicist or a doctor or a therapist that power. Um, you, know, you have the control. It's not somebody who is um, looking over your shoulder all the time who makes the decision for you. And so if you take that responsibility, knowing that the patient's safety is your, and the safety of other people in the clinic is, is your responsibility, uh, that's a really important place to start. Um, you know, as complexity increases, it's important that we simplify what's happening. So, 
you know, it's, it's, it's very important to simplify what, what each person's task is and let them be able to know that. The complete, the, the treatment planning or QA procedures should be simplified you know, so people uh, can easily do those because the complexity will increase errors. Um, uh, so I, like I mentioned, you know, I actually like, you know, at some point to hear from you whether you have recommendations um, uh, that you may, you, may, you may have that can be, you can suggest. I think uh, training is definitely a big one because uh, we wanna make sure that, you know, people are trained adequately. This picture uh, actually shows a radiation therapist, um, you know, usually they are, they are not considered, you know, in most, most centers, they don't realize the importance of these radiation therapies, whose role is really to deliver the treatment to the patients and make sure that they are happy uh, and it's done correctly. Uh, so um, you have to make sure that these people also feel empowered. It's, this is a control. They have the control at this point. And, uh, and so it's important that, you know, we... Okay. Yeah, this is an example of a simple interface. If you want to look for treatment planning. Uh, Google is kind of looked at as one of the good uh, examples. So imagine that, you know, you log on to Google, the website, you only see one point. So it's kind of really simple, you know, type in a word and it searches, right? So it's kind of as simple as you can go. Um, not have too many buttons on the website. Uh, it's a very simple interface. Um, all right. So the other recommendations that people have made are that, you know, you have to, if there's an error that happens, you have to make sure that you do a failure mode and effect, effects analysis, it's called FMAA, and uh, root cause analysis, kind of see what was it that caused that problem and to make sure that um, corrective action is done. Uh, they have now an international reporting system, like I mentioned, that this is one of the ways to do this where people can report. I think the IAEA has one uh, where incidences are being reported and that can help you know, to improve uh, patient safety. You may have heard about the ALARA principle. So the ALARA principle as low as reasonably uh, achievable when you do um, exposure to radiation. So that's something that medical physicists have to do. But you know, in another way, you can call it as safe as reasonably achievable. So ASARA principle. So you want to make sure that patients are, um, you know, you can as much as you have control over you make sure that patients are treated safely and that all the radiation therapy, it's not just the patients, also the, the treatment staff, including yourself, uh, because you, you have to deal with the radiation every day that you are safe as well. Um, yeah, so some of the timeouts, timeouts I mentioned that already, it's one of the recommendations that people have timeouts for you medical physicists, you know, you wanna make sure that you take a timeout too, take, drink a, take a cup of coffee or drink some tea, uh, something like that, just to refresh. Uh, having checklists to make sure that you have a checklist. Did you do this? Did you do that? Make sure that um, you, uh, you know, you even like, for example, you know, the non half what you call uh, patient recognition, facial recognition. So you have a patient in the clinic before you turn on the beam. You want to make sure that that's the patient you are supposed to treat. So you don't treat the wrong patient. So you have that on your checklist. You know, you can always make sure that those errors don't happen. Um, so be a safety champion, definitely. So yeah, this is the slides I was gonna show you that this is an audit in, in the case where, um, you know, they sent out, this study was published uh, in the Red Journal where they sent out a phantom to different institutions across the United States. Uh, and they asked, they gave them a treatment plan that you deliver that same treatment plan uh, to that phantom uh, with a dosimeter in it. And then we'll read the dose and then we'll make sure, we'll see whether that's the dose that uh, the prescribed dose is actually what's delivered. And then they went back and checked to see whether there was any variation um, across the centers. And obviously what they found out was that some centers failed, uh, you know, and that's, this is just example to illustrate that, you know, this is a problem that is not just, um, that's also present in the United States, so. Okay, um, so one thing that we would like to really get from this lecture, I think is that safety, uh, it's very important. I uh, I have a feeling. My strong feeling is that the the because of the lack of number of people in each clinic in African countries and um, you know the the protocols and things like that. That these errors that are happening in the United States are also happening there. So um, 
you know, it's important that everybody takes care of, realizes that they can change and make sure patients are, are safe and also the staff. Um, I highlight two key things here that um, ASTRO did recommend as an action plan. One of them is education and training programs that include intensive training in safety. Um, you know, some of the tutorials that are gonna be off through this career course are gonna be trying to reinforce that. Um, and then, you know, one thing that the IAE has been doing really nicely, which I really like, is the fact that they've been advocating for the recognition of medical physicists uh, by governments in Africa and other low and middle income countries. Um, it's very important that you feel appreciated as a medical physicist and feel that and see what your role is, you know, it's quite important. Um, so these are some of the successes in most areas. And I've, I know I've painted a, a picture of uh, the fact that you always have these errors, but yeah, um, there's been a lot of uh, stuff written about the success. So by having checklists, uh, it's very, very important that you have a checklist of the things you're supposed to do. Um, and always consult, make sure that uh, those checklists, you check every single item on that checklist uh, before the patient is treated. Uh, you also need inspirational management. If you're a leader in your clinic, uh, please create a culture where, you know, those who work with you uh, feel appreciated. They feel that, you know, you, 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 they can talk to you without being afraid. Uh, and you can have a good communication between the staff in the clinic that really, really helps. So it can abolish the hierarchical nature of the treatment um, of the clinic. You feel that, you know, somebody is the boss, you're afraid to talk to the boss about what's going on. Um, timeouts have also been shown to be very effective. So, you know, you definitely want to take a timeout if you're a doctor, a physician, or you're a medical physicist, or you're a radiation therapist in particular, throughout the day when you treat patients continuously, it's important that you take a timeout. Uh, and then, you know, peer review is very, very important. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, it's good to be able to see what other people are doing. Um, it's, it's very true that, you know, in most developed countries, in the United States, for example, uh, you know, radiation therapy treatment is really a team effort. It's more like a team effort. And there's always regular peer review, uh, just like it's done in clinical trials to make sure that you know, people are doing the right, the right thing you know, talking to each other and learning from each other. So it's very important. So the bottom line is that, you know, safety is everyone's responsibility, um, which means that, you know, whether you're a radiation oncologist, clinical oncologist, medical physicist or therapist or nurse, uh, you know, safety is important. It's your responsibility. Uh, I should say that while this is true, um, you know, the job of a medical physicist is particularly uh, important because of, they have to ensure the safety of everybody. Uh, okay, so the last couple of slides, I'm just going to highlight, you know, a few things that are coming up uh, with the eCancer for All program. Uh, so as you're aware, some of this global career course is really a partnership between a number of um, leading institutions uh, across Europe and the United States to partner with, you know, developing country uh, institutions like you. Most of you are participating in this lecture and actually looking at you know, ways that we can work together to improve uh, clinical oncology practice. And so um, this initiative, we kind of, it's, you know, kind of shared this before, you may already know about this. It's kind of setting up this, the fact that even though we are separated, you may be separated geographically, uh, 4,000 miles apart, you know, somebody's in Europe or in America or in, in Africa, uh, there's still a way that we can do things together um, and uh, advanced clinical oncology and access for patients to have quality care. Uh, so, you know, we kind of establishing this comprehensive cancer center in the cloud, which will include components of care, research and education. Um, and obviously you may already be aware of this platform. Um, and one thing that apart from a care education research being done is that there's a lot of engagement of the diaspora. Uh, so a lot of the some of the professors you're going to be seeing giving lectures uh, are going to be, you know, diaspora members. Uh, one example to, to illustrate here, you know, the coordinator of this course, uh, Dr. Credit, I mean, he's, he was born in Nigeria. He's really, he's really championing this. He's doing an excellent job coordinating all, the whole thing. But that's really a good way where, you know, um, he's very passionate about it, being able to do that. That can also benefit his country. Um, and then industry is also important. 
uh, we just came back from Germany where we had uh, a global health summit. There we had representations from Nigeria, Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, and, uh, and a lot of industry uh, representatives who are looking at how you know, they can work together, we can all work together to increase access to quality, not just uh, access to treatment, but it has to be quality and quality treatment, which is safe uh, for patients. And then government leaders, like I mentioned, one thing is that medical physicists are not recognized. And so we, everybody has a role, whether it's the doctor or the therapist or the medical physicist, um, to make sure that some of these government leaders, they are not ignorant, that they know that this is important. So, um, you know, one of the things that has been done so far, you know, there's the prono, one thing that will be offered to everybody, um, and we, you know, to everybody who, who has access to a computer is the, this prono software that we have um, an agreement to, to offer to every single one of you, uh, access where you can continue to train, but also can get a support if you need, if you need to, for treatment planning and, and quality assurance. Um, and so um, right now, uh, at the end of this course, you know, the, the, the opportunity that you can contact uh, Dr. Credit or um, uh, uh, Bill, Bill Swanson, who, who, who is one of the people who are helping with this course. And uh, there's an email where you can send email and you get access to this. What happened is that, you know, you can use this platform uh, for treatment planning and quality assurance and peer review. So you can actually learn what other people are doing. Uh, let me give an example. Let's say you have a prostate cancer patient um, and you, you're wondering how you can do a treatment plan for that patient, or you can do quality assurance for that patient. Um, you know, you can actually uh, see good examples there where you know, people have uploaded CT data, um, data sets, and it's been contoured. You know, the treatment plan has been done and you can see what other people have done so you can Evaluate the plan, see what they did, what were the different fractions, how many fractions did they deliver, uh, from what angles, um, things like that. It can really be a useful uh, resource for the training. Um, and then if you have a complex case that you really don't know how to address, it will also provide a forum for you to get experts. Like I said, in the United States, the team effort, other people can be able to help you, tell you, give you suggestions how to treat that. And I, I say this with sympathy to most African uh, cancer centers because they actually get more complex patient cases than is done in the United States or in Europe. Uh, because patients always come late with their disease, the cancer is already metastasized, uh, you know, people are disfigured, um, you know, it's very difficult to, to do a treatment plan for those cases, even for people who've been training for years. Uh, and so, you know, just one as a point that this is the opportunity where in that case you can actually uh, get help. Don't feel that you know by asking uh, you know for that particular learning from that particular case uh, that you are showing weakness. Instead, um, if you do that for the patient, first of all, you get the best treatment plan for the patient, and second of all, everybody learns. Even residents in the United States are learning from this because they don't see those cases. Um, so we're very excited about this platform that's going to be offered, uh, Prono, for people to do that. Uh, we're also working with some vendors who can, industry partners who can also offer uh, remote quality assurance as a support um, so that even from a distance, um, you know, people can help you. You know, you can pick somebody who can, you know, you can have access, uh, can access your, um, you know, uh, your, your center uh, and, and can help you in doing your QA so that, um, you know, patients get treated safely. All right, so um, I don't see, let me just check the time. I don't know how long we've gone, but I think I was gonna have a uh, Bill show a little bit about this platform, but maybe we may just skip that today. Um, yeah, so we have about four minutes before two o'clock. So I think um, I'll give Bill a chance to talk about this. Uh, I'll just show you that this, this is something some of you may be very familiar with. Uh, you know, there's a contouring, which is really very helpful for, uh, for the doctors, radiation oncologists, um, and also for the medical physicists to be able to go there and see how you can contour, even for, for phantoms that you have to do your quality assurance on, you can really practice um, contouring here and seeing how, uh, what, what does it mean for a plan to pass uh, 
pass to be to pass the quality assurance criteria that you have. Um, so there's a the contouring and there's also the plan evaluation. Um, so I'm gonna see if I can give if Bill, Bill, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, good. So I can okay, so, all right. Yeah, make him the presenter uh, and Bill, you know, you don't have to, just five minutes, just show them about the, the platform. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, have, I already have it queued up. Okay. Okay, good. So you're a presenter now. Uh, hold on. Yep. Uh, wait a minute. Share from the whiteboard. I'm getting yep. these weird options here. Yeah, you can share your screen. I think you can click on. Uh, you're gonna see. Share from. Have you seen the presenter request? Tap play to share your screen. All right, here we go. Yeah. Do you see uh, my screen here? Do you see contouring accuracy? No, not yet. Oh, uh, okay. Hold on a second. Um, okay, yeah, I think it's. Oh, okay. now. Yes. Do you see contouring accuracy? We can see your screen, but it's blank, like it's. Just pure. Okay, it's uh, sort of weird. Hold on a second. Yep. Hold on. I'm not sure uh, what's wrong with this guy. Um. I'm using the I'm using the desktop app, so it's. Are you on your desktop? Yeah. It, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's not showing my actual desktop screen. I see a I see an option for share from cloud or tablet, share from the web, and share from the whiteboard. Yes, share from share from your. Okay, you're not seeing a desktop. Yeah, I'm not seeing a desktop option here. Uh, how do we do this? Okay, well, Bill, if you can do it. If you can do it. Yeah, sorry. If you can do it, that's fine. Um, I think what we'll do is that we'll just uh, send you our inf information and people can, and then you can grant access to all these people, anybody who's interested, and then they can follow up with you, um, you know, if needed to explain how it works. But it's kind of intuitive, the system itself. Um, so let's go ahead and... Uh, if you're able to get it at the end, fine. But if not, you know, uh, people can then contact you separately. Okay. Um, so, credit, please give me the screen again. I should let me just wrap wrap up this. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, I have it. Yeah. All right. So, so my screen kind of shows some of the. It's actually some of the data from. Um, those who were able to attend the class, uh, I think three months ago, uh, just showing how they have been able to improve their confidence uh, in different aspects of treatment planning and quality assurance. Uh, uh, you know, structure identification, and which is quite important to be able to, be able to contour. Uh, contouring abilities, we really like the Prono system because it's kind of easy, really nice tools, very similar to the one you have in your treatment planning system. How you can evaluate those volume histograms, um, and all of those things. So that was that was a really good success story. And I think that at the end of this training, uh, many more people will be able to benefit from this. Um, all right. So uh, the big question now is what can be done to support you in ensuring safety in radiation therapy? I think I want to open this up so that um, everybody gets to make some input on this. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to sh show you some resources that uh, can also help you in terms of the patient safety. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that after we discuss, um, you know, what do you think, you know, uh, some recommendations we can, we can consider or, you know, how we can best support you as a medical physicist in, uh, in your clinic to ensure safety. So uh, credit, if you want, you can open up a uh, discussion so people can ask or give some feedback on this. All right, so um, everyone is open now so you can talk. And you can ask your questions and make your contributions as well as your feedback. Uh, you have to click on your microphone and unmute it as soon as you 
you come into the class um, and if you want to ask okay sure i think uh, bill can share his screen now let me see Okay, any questions? Another way to ask a question is just type it in the chat box. You yeah. Know, and then maybe ask that, you know. Okay. That you may can... be an easier way. Yeah. Yeah. You can also. Can people see my screen now? Yeah. You we can see what's screen, screen now. Here? We can see the screen now. Sure. All right, great. All right, so uh, just briefly, I'll show you essentially if you uh, make an account, you're a part of our organization uh how you can navigate this website and uh start doing your own learning modules on uh contouring uh essentially here i've logged in uh here i'm selected as the general pro no uh, population organization here i just wanted to show you uh what the screen kind of looks like this is your dashboard uh here there are there's a whole library of structures where uh you can do you can do uh, these learning modules of how to contour these specific structures. We've done one previously, the left parented, and uh, essentially you click on that and you have these tabs here. You essentially just go left to right, and uh, starting here at the background, you go ahead and click on this document here. This is a PDF. Very straightforward, a quick brief lesson on what the parotid gland is, where it is in the body, and how to essentially uh, identify all of the anatomic uh, landmarks in order to properly contour uh, that in your CT. Uh, now, after that, uh, hold on, I have another thing set up here. Uh, no, wait, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, let me go back here. Uh, what you're going to want to do is when you eventually have your own thing. You want to go uh, to your organization here. I have one global radiation oncology. I have not made an attempt on this one yet. You'll see, you'll click on that. Uh, you'll go to, you'll read the document. You go to contour and score, and then you'll have uh, a launch contouring button. You go ahead and click on that. And now you have the CT right in front of you, and you can use all of these very, uh, intuitive uh, traditional contouring tools just like you'd see on any other system where you can start making uh, contours of this structure now once I'm done I'm not gonna I'm not gonna finish this right now I'm just gonna hit back here uh, you'd say I'm finished it was there in the lower left hand corner and when you're finished you'd say generate score it will give you a score uh, based on how well you did compared to the reference expert contour of that structure. Now, if I go here, uh, now this one I've actually made uh, an attempt at. Once you've made an attempt and gotten a score, you go to the next tab, learn, and now you'll have access to this video. It's a nice, quick video of... Uh, and the level, and that's the center of the window, is set at 40. So you have uh, an instructor here that's giving you a tutorial on how to uh, contour that structure. Once you look at that, you can go to the next tab, redo and practice. You can launch the contouring uh, app again. This is all within your browser, so you don't have to download any software to access and use this, which is very convenient. Now here's a later attempt at my, uh, my own. Uh, and what it'll show you, it'll give you a score uh, with respect to the expert contour. And me, I, I'm just a grad student. I don't know what I'm doing with this thing. So here's my first attempt uh, at uh, contouring this structure. You can see here in green, it shows you uh, where I have successfully contoured the structure compared to the uh, expert contour. The expert contour is the solid line here, and then my contour is in this dashed line. In red, you can see the parts that I've contoured that are beyond 
the expert contour. And then uh, in blue is what the expert contoured that I uh, did not include in mine. When you come down here, you can see uh, your distance volume histogram here uh, showing uh, parts that you missed and parts that you hit as well. Once you look at that, uh, you can go into this is uh, to get some credits with uh, uh, as like a resonance or things like that. Not really important at the moment. But here, population results, I can look at if this thing's going to work with me. Okay, here we go. Um, I can look at um, how I did compared to uh, anyone else that's also performed this task. And what I think is really interesting is this, is this is the consensus uh, map. It's essentially a heat map of showing where everyone thought the contour was. Uh, in the very dark blue here, uh, you can see that between uh, 0 and 10% of users uh, included these dark blue regions in the in their contours they could see that you could see here that some people actually went on the right side of the uh of the ct where actually this was a contour of the left parotid not the right parotid so you could see the difference between them and if i scroll through oh, let's see if i scroll through again yeah i uh, was playing with that a little bit um you can see more people, you can see 60% of the users uh, contoured the area in green. So you can see uh, how you compared with uh, your peers in, uh, in that structure. And you can do this for all other structures as well. If I go back to the dashboard, uh, these public structures here, these are ones you can access for free. You got the left parotid, anus CT, uh, pharyngeal constrictors, and whatnot. Uh, but if I go back to the general prono, these are all of the others that they have in their libraries. Uh, we're going to see what we can do about getting access to those, and uh, we'll uh, get back to you on that. But um, other than that, this is what you would see as you're accessing uh, prono. Okay. Okay, thanks, Bill. And I think the, the other thing is the idea that you know, which is one thing that you get, once you get access to this, it's also that you can actually upload your own CT data set. Um, and uh, I see somebody asked a question about that, whether you can take diagnostic images or treatment sites uh, to determine the level of tumor shrinkage. So it's very, you have the opportunity where you can upload your images. Do you have the upload tab somewhere, Bill? I think there's an upload tab where you can... Um, there is actually, no... There's no specific upload tab. Um, at the I think there is in the plant studies. You have to go to the in plant, plant studies. studies there is. Um, I don't, uh, not in this screen here. Um, that's something you actually have to have the uh, premium membership for uh, in order to gain access to that. And I think that would have to actually be under my organizations as a manager of our uh, organization here. So that's, okay. uh, we'll have to work on that one and uh, see how, how we can uh, get that working. Okay, so we don't have that available right now. So yeah, we need Not to make yet. sure that, uh, okay, okay, good. All right, so that's, that, but that's gonna be a feature that uh, everybody's gonna have, uh, which means that you can also upload a planned CT data set um, that you, including a treatment plan that you did on your own treatment planning system in your clinic, and other people can peer review that and be able to make sure that is the right uh, treatment plan. And again, I say you don't have to do that for all cases, but there may be a really complex case in your clinic that you think uh, you could use some uh, input on from other people, you know, and then we can, you can actually get that kind of feedback. Um, so anyway, thank you very much, Bill. So this is one of the tools that uh, we'll be offering to everybody to kind of practice how you can contour, how you can evaluate treatment plans to make sure that, to see whether they pass the criteria that you want. Uh, so um, I'm just gonna end by saying that uh, there are a number of other opportunities. Can you give my screen? Um, okay. Give me the screen. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, okay, so uh, there's a number of things that you know that you may want to be aware of. So, currently, this course you have to go if you go on Global Health Catalyst Talent LMS. Uh, the slides for this course and the slides for every course that you're going to get, every lecture that you're going to get during this. Uh, course are going to be posted online. So if you haven't signed up on it, uh, it's important that you do so. Uh, you're also going to have, uh, uh, you're going to have videos and all the, all the, if you missed this class or you missed anything, you can go back there and you can watch what happened. Um, and at the same time, at some point, we're going to be able to have some kind of evaluation because uh, we want to evaluate and also provide certificates for those who attend this course uh, so that you can get, um, continuous education credit for that. And uh, if you actually look at the syllabus, there'll also be opportunities to invite participants to, um, to the Harvard Global Health Catalyst Summit in May next year, um, because we want to really engage and make sure that, you know, this is not just something that, that we can help in the best way possible, but also allow you to do other things, you know, not just uh, the clinical care, but also involved maybe in the research and, uh, and, uh, and other things and outreach to make sure that you know your, your government leaders and the industry can work together with you. All right, so actually Professor Derek was going to uh, talk about I Treat Safely. Uh, so this is one of the websites that uh, they have videos that you can actually go there and see how uh, you do commissioning for a new LINAC. Uh, what do you do about IMRTQA? If you're doing intensive modulated radiation therapy QA, what you should do, things like that. So that's a very useful resource that uh, that you may want to take, take care of. And then uh, I want to highlight this opportunity that we just got from from Europe, uh, the European Federation of Organization for Medical Physicists. They um, offer travel grants uh, that can help you um, train, for, come for workshops in Europe. Uh, to complement some of the online training that's being done. So I have this link here. It's also going to be posted online on the Talent LMS, uh, the, the link that I have at the top here. So you can actually go in there and look at that. Maybe there'll be maybe opportunities that you want to take advantage of. Uh, and then I want to highlight that uh, we'll be having a training workshop face-to-face -face, uh, in Tanzania. We're planning something in March next year. So uh, that may be something if you are interested to attend. Um, you may want to sign up or send an email to Dr. Credit, um, have you on the list. And then um, in the next lectures, we're actually going to be having tutorials. So tutorials means that, you know, we'll be able to have more, apart from just me or lecture, lecturer talking, there's going to be activity that you can actually do, uh, you know, to kind of make the training more real. Um, so, um, so watch out for that. And then I think I have a link here of an IMRTQA. It's very, very nice resource for if you want to do uh, density modulated radiation therapy quality assurance, patient specific QA. That's a very useful resource that can make sure that you're doing it, uh, making sure the patient has uh, safe treatment. And uh, then finally, uh, you know, next, next week's lecture, there will be one lecture next week. That one is going to focus on. Um, you know, uh, machine design. So you want to learn how your machine is uh, that you use to treat patients and also on dosimetry. How do you calculate dose? Um, you know, that's a very important thing that you need to, to know because each time you get your a new machine, you want to make sure that, you know, you can actually uh, measure the dose on that and to be able to make sure that that's the dose that you are delivering the patient is actually accurate. Um, and I have a video here that's uh, a video link here at the end at the bottom, which uh, kind of teases out that lecture that's coming up next week. So you may want to watch that as well at your own convenience. Okay. All right, so I'm going to end there um, and also put that link up there, where, which is really the course website. Make sure that you sign on to that to see all the resources that are already posted over there. Um, all right, thanks for your attention. If there are any questions, please. Um, post those questions. Or yeah. ask the uh, question. 
Are you going to open that up? Uh, yes, yes, it's actually open. And anyone and can ask us. Good. All right. Okay, just why um, you are here to ask your question, I just want to say um, thank you very much for coming. Um, would like to indicate, because the class, you know, we have three tracks. So we have the radiation oncology track and then the medical physics track. And then for those who are interested in research, the clinical research and grant writing track. Um, so what we like to, I know some of us have been taking the radiation oncology class as well, which is very beneficial to us. Um, but we like to know um, the track you are actually taking. And I'm actually taking note of the attendance because um, some people come into class and I'm taking note of those who are coming and I'm building the portfolio for our certifications. Um, but we like to know your track, which track you are going to be in. You can be in medical physics and radiation oncology. You can be in the three if you want to, but want to keep track of those who are in the medical physics um, training track. So um, what I would love us to do is I'm going to, on, the, on our website, on our web portal for this lecture, I'm going to design and put the lectures in three different tracks. We're going to have radiation oncology, medical physics, and then a career track. I just want you to click on each of the course and indicate that you are um, in either of them, anyone you choose to be in. So you can just click on one and add yourself to that group. So it's going to be like three different groups and you can add yourself to the group. So I'll do that and we can start doing that at most by Monday, as early as by Monday. Hopefully by, uh, by Wednesday next week, you should have indicated what track you're going to be in. All you just need to do is log into this website on the screen right now and then click yourself and um, add yourself into any of the group as a student in any of the group. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's actually very important because, uh, you know, if we're gonna award certificates at the end, I wanna make sure that, um, you know, you get the certificates for each of those tracks. Um, I think the grant writing and research track would be very, very interesting as well. They haven't started the lecture. I think the first lecture is up next week, Saturday. Um, so definitely indicate which of those tracks so that um, Petit can also keep track of that. So at the end, if you get your certificates, uh, you can get either for each track that you attended. So it's clear. All right. Any questions? Okay. If there's no questions, then um, we'll wrap it up. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. See you next week. Okay. All right. Thank bye you, guys. Bye. bye. Thank you very bye. much for. Bye. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Bye bye. bye.